Hello there, Bingo. I found several of your cousins. How are my cousins finding the festival? Ah, excellent, excellent. It seems they're all enjoying it in their own peculiar ways, but... What's this about young Denandus not being frightened easily? Well, we will have to do something about that, Pintronella. We will. This is a season for spooks and a festival for fright. He is missing out on a great deal of fun at this time of year if he does not allow himself to be scared. Really, Bingo? So I must admit that when we first met, you were scared of a lot of things. Yes, you have already agreed to join us on the green fields for the sharing of spooky stories and all, but now that I know Dinadus believes himself to be above scaring, I fear my own stories will not be enough. Not frightening enough at all. I need you to do some research, Pine Trap. Yes, can I ask you to make a trip to Tuckbro and to secure the assistance of Dona Mira Took, the librarian at the Great Schmeels. She has an unrivaled understanding of the contents of the library, and she will certainly know where to find a tome or two with the scariest of all Hobbit stories within it. Find me suitably scary stories, and I will make one or two further arrangements, and we will be ready for telling tales when it is dark enough. Yes, and... Dusk is rapidly approaching, so I better head on right away. Hello there, Donna Mira. Bingo is looking for some really frightening stories. Do you think you have any? You're looking for a book on scary stories. Well, I cannot say that any come immediately to mind, for hobbits do not generally write down such things, though they do enjoy sharing them in person especially in warm comfort, and with the dark of night safely beyond the shutter panes and far away. But you're welcome to look for yourself. All right, I can see if there's anything here. Any interesting books here? Yeah, nothing particularly scary here. No, nothing scary there. Nothing, eh? Hey, maybe we could show him an overdue library notice with a lot of... Never mind. And let's see. Ah, here's a tattered book. Yes. This looks like it'll do. Well, this is very curious. I do not believe I have ever seen this book before. The letters on the cover are very faded and most indistinct. I cannot read very much of the title, but the first word seems to be chill. I believe it promises chilling tales, and a cursory examination seems to bear out this presumption. Feel free to take it with you, Pine Tranella, and bring it back to Bingo Boffin for his perusal. May it increase his enjoyment of the Harvest Festival, and I'm sure that he will return it to me. Eventually. It's Petronella. Did you hire this goat rider to help in the frightening stories? Ah, this book looks perfect, Pintronella. Thank you very much. I shall spend some time becoming acquainted with the tales within, and it will be time to share spooky stories before you know it. Yes, it's getting on dark time now, so I'll see you at the stories, right? Is it time to go now? Yes, it's nearly time. Let me know when you're ready, and we will go to the green fields together. Well, Bingo. It's dark out here. Yes, this is the perfect night to share spooky stories, Pine Trinella. Even better than I hoped. Many of my cousin Prisca's children have told me that they have their own stories ready to share. And I have one of my own as well. Bolster your courage, my friend. And let us celebrate the scary spirit of the season. All right. You could choose who gets to share the first story, Pine Trinella. Anyway, see, even Prisca is willing to share one. How about... 
Camellia. When we came here to see Cousin Bingo and celebrate the Harvest Festival with him, we crossed the Brandywine Bridge and took a look at the road of stock. Do you all remember looking across the water and seeing the farms of Budgeford? My story took place at one of those farms, and the events told therein happened not so long ago. I know these events are true, though they sound unbelievable. The story was told to me by someone who would know the truth of the matter. The farm stood right on the river's edge and belonged to a harbit, hobbit named Everard. He was a bolger, as are many of the folk of Budgeford. But whereas most of the bolgers are fine farmers, Everard struggled daily to maintain his crop. Either it was taken by blight, or savaged by crows, or munched by rabbits, and on many occasions he had to depend upon the charity of his neighbors for his family to survive. Everard blamed his scarecrow most of all. No matter how hard he tried, he could not fashion a suitably frightening scarecrow. Every day the birds came to feast on his crops, undeterred. He was at his wit's end on a Tuesday, and even as he glowered at the failing scarecrow, a raven flew down from the sky and lighted upon it. Oh, I'll teach you what you deserve, Everard growled as he swung his trowel at the bird. The raven flew just out of reach and then landed once upon the scarecrow's straw hat. You seem upset, friend, the raven said. This set Everard's back a bit. For a while, he had heard stories of speaking birds. He had never encountered one himself, though. Upset, he managed. Of course I'm upset. You birds won't leave my crops alone, you vile things. It does seem like you deserve better, the raven responded. If you like, I can speak... Speak to my people and see if perhaps we could come to an arrangement. I'd be willing to do this for you if you let me sample some of these grains. Ephrar thought it over and could see few drawbacks in the raven's proposal. After all, one bird's appetite would be less than a whole flock's, and by giving up some of the crop, he might secure safety for the rest. I agree, he told the bird and watched it as it devoured some of the crop and flew away. The next day saw little improvement, and birds continued to harry his crops. He was certain that he would not see that raven again, but, to his surprise, the bird appeared and spoke. They say they will help you out, but they can't resist the taste of the crops you're growing here. They said what you need is a better scarecrow. That would make it much more difficult for them to fly near. I have tried to make one scarier, Everard said, but it does no good. Let's see what we can do, the raven replied. The Tuesday sun crossed the sky, and as dusk approached, Everard's wife sent their daughter Holly to bring Everard in for supper. As Holly approached the field, she marveled at how lifelike appeared the second scarecrow her father had made. He must have spent all day fashioning it. It looked just like a hobbit. As she watched, a raven hopped among the grades, squawking, and flew away. Holly told me the story herself, and she wouldn't joke about that. It's all true. Well, that was certainly something. Who would go next? Yes. Who would go next? How about Esmeralda? I don't have a story prepared, but I am happy just listening. Okay. Well, how about you, Dinadas? If none of these stories can scare you, can you come up with a scary one to scare the others? <laughs> I think I have made myself very clear, Pine Trinella. I am not telling a story. Pick someone else. Okay, fine. Hmm. How about you?
you, Prisca? I do not know very many spooky stories, but I know another of my children would love to go next. Uh, not Dina does, perhaps, but someone else. All right. Hmm. How about Griffo? Ah, my story is a cautionary tale, but I urge you not to discount it, for it is also true. Very true. Yes, uh, the events of this story took place not so very long ago, shortly after the new homesteads were made available in the Shire. A very old, and by most accounts rather unpleasant hobbit, the widow Spinner, was enamored of one of the homes of Myrtle Court, and she greatly desired to purchase it. She was not the only interested buyer, of course, but... She had the most money to spend, and she was able to outbid their chief rival, a young hobbit named Bob Newbuck. She purchased the most desirable home on Myrtle Court, and she lived there for several months, much to Bob's consternation. Well, Bob wasn't one to give up, even when losing a contest and he made it a point to pass by Myrtle Court as often as possible, scowling in the direction of the Widow Spinner's home at every opportunity. One night, as he paused, passed by the lane, he heard a strange voice calling in the darkness. He looked more closely and saw the Widow Spinner standing in a yard beside her burrow, wearing a long nightshirt and a sleeping cat. Crazy old bat, Bob thought to himself as he continued down the lane in his own com com comparatively disappointed and cramped burrow. Thinking back on the curious sight some time later, Bob decided that he might have been the last person to see the widow spinner before she disappeared. Indeed, no one else could tell the sheriffs what had happened to her or where she had gone. Bob was as helpful as he could be, and he told them what little he knew, but it was not long before the widow spinner was declared dead and six Myrtle Court was once again available for purchase. Bob wasted no time and purchased the house, and it was everything he hoped it would be. He decorated it to his liking, and lived there happily for several months. He was lying in bed, and one night, sometime after midnight, he heard a voice. Help me! It called from somewhere outside Bob's cozy bedroom. Oh, what is that? Bob wondered to himself, and he pulled the covers up to his chin. Help me! The voice called again. Bob squeezed his eyes shut, but then decided that the morning was too far off and there would be no escaping the plaintive voice. He followed his call out of the bedroom, down the hall, and finally outside. The air was cold and the night was dark, but he was able to hear the voice clearly enough to follow it to the side yard where the well was dug. Sure enough, the voice echoed up from the dark hole in the ground. Help me, it asked again. Bob leaned over the hole and scowled. Spinner, is that you down there? He began, but he wasn't able to finish the thought before something slammed him into his back and he slipped onto the wet grass. Bob tumbled down the well, and everything went dark. When he awoke, he was lying half in and half out of the water, deep inside the well. A crevice in the wall opened into the chamber, dug out of the dirt, and he was wedged painfully in the crack. He was woozy, and it was hard to make his eyes focus. Gradually they did, and he saw the widow spinner sitting on the floor, leaning against the wall of the dirt chamber, a teapot and several plates arranged around here. 
help me, the voice said once again. And Bob realized that it came not from the widow's spinner, but from somewhere much closer, right by his ear. Help me set out the tea, it continued. She will be so happy to have someone over for tea. Something pulled on his arm roughly, and then Bob disappeared into the dirt chamber. He was never seen again. I heard that Six Myrtle Court is available for purchase again, if you don't mind tea at midnight. Oh, hey, gave myself the shivers. Oh, boy. Nonsense, these stories are rubbish. Not at all. Is it my turn? Oh, I have a good story to tell. All right, Bingo, what's your story? I hope it doesn't uh, involve teapots. The story I'm about to tell is older than each of the others that I have heard tonight, for it dates from the earliest days of the Shire and is recorded in very few places. I found it in a book that Pine Trinella retrieved from the library in the Great Schmales, but it seems to me there were few copies of that book ever made. Once I tell you the story, it will live on, and you will all remember it. Even in the earliest days of the Shire, festivals were already important to our distant ancestors. Were there boffins even then? I'd like to think so, although I have not seen a family tree that extends back that far. Certainly, some branches of our family tree bear similar names to those of the earliest inhabitants of the Shire, and I have seen accounts of Esmeraldas, Marigolds, Griffos, and Foscos, but I'm getting distracted. A young girl by the name of Menegilda desired to win a dancing competition, but her chief rival, one Paeony, excelled at the art and bested her in every opportunity. Menegilda was obsessed with winning the great prize, and she became convinced that Peony owed her success to the violet shoes that she always wore. Menegilda hatched a plan to steal the shoes. She surprised Peony on the banks of the Brandywine and demanded she hand over the shoes. Peony refused and said that there was a spell on the shoes. They would work only at her command, and they would do Menegilda no good at all. Menegilda was not dissuaded. In fact, the revelation that the shoes were enchanted filled her with happiness. At last, an explanation for her continued failure to beat Peony at dancing. Peony removed the shoes and threw them at her rival. Fine, then, she cried. Have them. I will tell my father what you've done, and you won't be allowed to dance at all. This was a mistake. But Peony did not understand the rage that seethed within Menegilda's heart. Menegilda charged at her with her arms raised as she pushed Peony into the river. She never surfaced. Menegilda put on her stolen shoes and returned to town. There were whispers, but none had seen her encounter with Peony, and it was believed that Peony may have run away, seeking her fortune beyond the borders of the Shire. Menegilda did not care, though. Her every thought was bent on winning the next dance contest. A few weeks later, Menegilda wore her new shoes and danced on the stage before all the assembled hobbits. Everyone cheered and applauded, for they had never seen such dancing before, not even when Peony had participated. Menegilda was the clear winner. And yet, something was wrong. Someone tried to present Menegilda with the winning ribbon, but she merely continued to dance. Everyone applauded again, but 
she showed no signs of stopping. I think that's enough, dear, someone called. But now there were tears streaming down Menegilda's face, and the assemblage came to understand that she wanted to stop, but could not. Folk rushed the stage and sought to remove the violet shoes, but they wouldn't come off. Menegilda's feet flew left and right here and there, but even when she fell into a stupor, the dance continued. At last, it stopped, but Menegilda's dancing days were done. The shoes were packed into a box, and it was sealed away, but hidden in a dusty corner in a forgotten burrow. Hoppet spoke for a time of Minigilda and her cursed shoes, but eventually the story passed into legend, and folk doubted that it ever really happened, even as they feared to speak of it. And that's why hobbits never wear shoes. Oh? Is that why? <laughs> that's not true. Uh, that can't be true. How do you know? It's just rubbish. All of these stories are nonsense. Well, it's interesting you should say that, Dino. Because I went and had a chat with the Brombard Foxtail at the Madam House. And he did some digging around and he found the very same shoes from the story. And here they are. What? He can it what you you got the shoes really there is no way that they can be the same shoes uh really does anyone want to try them on i'll do it i'm not afraid really esmeralda are you sure i mean you need a little incentive to dance esmeralda i'm not scared mother She's not afraid of dancing, apparently. All right, well, she's got her shoes on. They fit perfectly. Well, then. Yay! There you go. See? Nothing to worry about. Yay! All right, Esmeralda. You should probably take them off now. Uh, Esmeralda? Ah! I, I can't! I, I can't stop! Oh no, Esmeralda! Oh no! Uh, Patronella, help her! Uh, okay, I'm trying to take them off. Yes, here, here, are they coming off? No, they won't come off. No! It's all true! It's all true! Ah! Oh. What was that all about, Bingo? What was that all about? A little prank, Bingo? Apparently so. What else is in store? We'll have to find that out in the next episode of The Ballad of Bingo Boffin. Epilogue. Scary Stories.